Chapter Twenty Four of Lives of the Most Eminent Painters, Sculptors, and Architects, Volume Five. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Morgan Scorpion. Lives of the Most Eminent Painters, Sculptors, and Architects, Volume Five, by Giorgio Vasari. Translated by Gaston de C. de Vere. Lives of Morto da Feltro and Andrea di Cosimo Feltrini. The painter Morto da Feltro, who was as original in his life as he was in his brain and in the new fashion of grotesques that he made, which caused him to be held in great estimation, found his way as a young man to Rome at the time when Pinturicchio was painting the papal apartments for Alexander the Sixth, with the loggia and the lower rooms in the great tower of the Castello di San Angelo and some of the upper apartments. He was a melancholy person and was constantly studying the antiquities, and seeing among them sections of vaults and ranges of walls adorned with grotesques. He liked these so much that he never ceased from examining them and so well did he grasp the methods of drawing foliage in the ancient manner that he was second to no man of his time in that profession he was never tired indeed of examining all that he could find below the ground in rome in the way of ancient grottoes with vaults innumerable he spent many months in hadrian's villa at tivoli drawing all the pavements and grottoes that are there both above ground and below and hearing that at Pozzuolo, in the kingdom of Naples, ten miles from the city, there were many walls covered with ancient grotesques, both executed in relief, with stucco and painted, and said to be very beautiful, he devoted several months to studying them on the spot. Nor was he content until he had drawn every last thing in the Campana, an ancient road in that place, full of antique sepulchres and he also drew many of the temples and grottoes both above and below the ground at trullo near the seashore he went to baia and mercata di sabato both places full of ruined buildings covered with scenes searching out everything in such a manner that by means of his long and loving labour he grew vastly in power and knowledge of his art having then returned to rome he worked there many months giving his attention to figures, since he considered that in that part of his profession he was not the master that he was held to be in the execution of grotesques. And after he had conceived this desire, hearing the renown that Leonardo and Michael Agnolo had in that art on account of the cartoons executed by them in Florence, he set out straightway to go to that city but after he had seen those works he did not think himself able to make the same improvement that he had made in his first profession and he went back therefore to work at his grotesques there was then living in florence one andrea di cosimo feltrini a painter of that city and a young man of much diligence who received morto into his house and entertained him with most affectionate attentions Finding pleasure in the nature of Morto's art, Andrea also gave his mind to that vocation, and became an able master, being in time even more excellent than Morto, and much esteemed in Florence, as will be told later. And it was through Andrea that Morto came to paint for Piero Soderini, who was then gonfalonier, decorations of grotesques in an apartment of the palace, which were held to be very beautiful but in our own day these have been destroyed in rearranging the apartments of duke cosimo and repainted for maestro valerio a servite friar morto decorated the empty space on a chair back which was a most beautiful work and for agnolo doni likewise in a chamber he executed many pictures with a variety of bizarre grotesques and since he also delighted in figures he painted our lady in some round pictures in order to see whether he could become as famous for them as he was for his grotesques 
Then, having grown weary of staying in Florence, he betook himself to Venice, and attaching himself to Giorgione da Castelfranco, who was then painting the Fondaco de Tedeschi, he set himself to assist him, and executed the ornamentation of that work and in this way he remained many months in that city, attracted by the sensuous pleasures and delights that he found there. He then went to execute works in Friuli, but he had not been there long when, finding that the rulers of Venice were enlisting soldiers, he entered their service, and before he had had much experience of that calling he was made captain of two hundred men. The army of the Venetians had advanced by that time to Zara in Slavonia, and one day, when a brisk skirmish took place, Morto, desiring to win a greater name in that profession than he had gained in the art of painting, went bravely forward, and, after fighting in the melee, was left dead on the field, even as he had always been in name at the age of forty-five. But in fame he will never be dead, because those who exercise their hands in the arts and produce everlasting works leaving memorials of themselves after death are destined never to suffer the death of their labours for writers in their gratitude bear witness to their talents eagerly therefore should our craftsmen spur themselves on with incessant study to such a goal as will ensure them an undying name both through their own works and through the writings of others since by so doing they will gain eternal life both for themselves and for the works that they leave behind them after their death morto restored the painting of grotesques in a manner more like the ancient than was achieved by any other painter and for this he deserves infinite praise in that it is after his example that they have been bought in our own day by the hands of giovanni da udine and other craftsmen to the great beauty and excellence that we see for although the said giovanni and others have carried them to absolute perfection it is none the less true that the chief praise is due to morto who was the first to bring them to light and to devote his whole attention to paintings of that kind which are called grotesques because they were found for the most part in the grottos of the ruins of rome besides which every man knows that it is easy to make additions to anything once it has been discovered the painting of grotesques was continued in florence by andrea feltrini called di cosimo because he was a disciple of cosimo rosselli in the study of figures which he executed passing well as he was afterwards of morto in that of grotesques of which we have spoken in this kind of painting andrea had from nature such power of invention and such grace that he was the first to make ornaments of greater grandeur abundance and richness than the ancient and quite different in manner and he gave them better order and cohesion and enriched them with figures such as are not seen in rome or in any other place but florence where he executed a great number in this respect there has never been any man who has surpassed him in excellence as may be seen from the ornament and the predella painted with little grotesques in colour round the pieta that pietro perugino executed for the altar of the serristori in santa croce at florence these are highlighted with various colours on a ground of red and black mixed together and are wrought with much facility and with extraordinary boldness and grace andrea introduced the practice of covering the facades of houses and palaces with an intonaco of lime mixed with the black of ground charcoal or rather burnt straw on which intonaco when still fresh he spread a layer of white plaster then having drawn the grotesques with such divisions as he desired on some cartoons he dusted them over the intonaco and proceeded to scratch it with an iron tool in such a way that his designs were traced over the whole facade by that tool after which scraping away the white from the grounds of the grotesques he went on to shade them or to hatch a good design upon them with the same iron tool finally he went over the whole work shading it with a liquid water-colour like water tinted with black 
all this produces a very pleasing rich and beautiful effect and there was an account of the method in the twenty sixth chapter dealing with sgraffiti in the treatise on technique the first facades that andrea executed in this manner were that of the gondi which is full of delicacy and grace in borg of Lissanti, and that of lanfredino lanfredini which is very ornate and rich in the variety of its compartments on the lungano between the ponte san trinita and the ponte della caraglia near santo spirito he also decorated in sgraffito the house of andrea and tommaso sartini near san michele in piazza padella making it more varied and grander in manner than the two others he painted in chiaroscuro the façade of the church of the Servite friars for which work he caused the painter tommaso di stefano to paint in two niches the angel bringing the annunciation to the virgin and in the court where there are the stories of san filippo and our lady painted by andrea del sarto he executed between the two doors a very beautiful escutcheon of pope leo x and on the occasion of the visit of that pontiff to florence he executed many beautiful ornaments in the form of grotesques on the facade of santa maria del fiore for jacopo sansovino which gave him his sister for wife he executed the baldachin under which the pope walked covering the upper part with most beautiful grotesques and the hangings round it with the arms of that pope and other devices of the church and this baldachin was afterwards presented to the church of San Lorenzo in Florence, where it is still to be seen. He also decorated many standards and banners for the visit of Leo, and in honour of many who were made chevalier by that pontiff and by other princes, of which there are some hung up in various churches in that city. Andrea, working constantly in the service of the house of Medici, assisted at the preparations for the wedding of duke giolano and that of duke lorenzo executing an abundance of various ornaments in the form of grotesques and so also in the obsequies of those princes in all this he was largely employed by franciabigio andrea del sarto pontormo and ridolfo ghirlandaio and by Granaccio for triumphal processions and other festivals, since nothing good could be done without him. He was the best man that ever touched a brush, and being timid by nature, he would never undertake any work on his own account, because he was afraid of exacting the money for his labours. He delighted to work the whole day long, and disliked annoyances of any kind for which reason he associated himself with the gilder mariotto di francesco one of the most able and skilful men at his work that ever existed in the world of art very adroit in obtaining commissions and most dexterous in exacting payments and doing business this mariotto also brought the gilder raffaello di biagio into the partnership and the three worked together sharing equally all the earnings of the commissions that they executed and this association lasted until death parted them mariotto being the last to die to return to the works of andrea he decorated for giovanni maria benintendi all the ceilings of his house and executed the ornamentation of the antechambers wherein are the scenes painted by franciabigio and jacopo da pontormo he went with franciabigio to poggio and executed in terretta the ornaments for all the scenes there in such a way that there is nothing better to be seen for the chevalier guidotti he decorated in sgraffito the facade of his house in the via larga and he also executed another of great beauty for bartolomeo panciatici on the house now belonging to roberto di ricci which he built on the piazza degli agli nor am i able to describe all the friezes coffers and strong boxes or the vast quantity of ceilings which andrea decorated with his own hand for the whole city is full of these and i must refrain from speaking of them but i must mention the round escutcheons of various kinds that he made for they were such that no wedding could take place without his having his workshop besieged by one citizen or another 
nor could any kind of brocade linen or cloth of gold with flowered patterns ever be woven without his making the designs for them and that with so much variety grace and beauty that he breathed spirit and life into all such things if andrea indeed had known his own value he would have made a vast fortune but it sufficed him to live in love with his art i must not omit to tell that in my youth while in the service of duke alessandro de medici i was commissioned when charles v came to florence to make the banners for the castle or rather as it is called at the present day the citadel and among these was a standard of crimson cloth eighteen braccia wide at the staff and forty in length and surrounded by borders of gold containing the devices of the emperor charles v and the house of medici with the arms of his majesty in the centre for this work in which were used forty-five thousand leaves of gold i summoned to my assistance andrea for the borders and mariotto for the gilding and many things did i learn from that good andrea so full of love and kindness for those who were studying art and so great did the skill of andrea then prove to be that besides availing myself of him for many details of the arches that were erected for the entry of his majesty i chose him as my companion together with trabolo when madama margherita daughter of charles v came to be married to duke alessandro in making the festive preparations that i executed in the house of the magnificent ottaviano de medici on the piazza di san marco which was adorned with grotesques by his hand with statues by the hand of tribolo and with figures and scenes by my hand at the last he was much employed for the obsequies of duke alessandro and even more for the marriage of duke cosimo when all the devices in the courtyard described by m francesco diambulari who wrote an account of the festivities of that wedding were painted by andrea with ornaments of great variety and then andrea who by reason of a melancholy humour which often oppressed him was on many occasions on the point of taking his own life but was observed so closely and guarded so well by his companion mariotto that he lived to be an old man finished the course of his life at the age of sixty-four leaving behind him the name of a good and even rarely excellent master of grotesque painting in our own times wherein every succeeding craftsman has always imitated his manner not only in florence but also in other places end of chapter twenty four Chapter 25 of Lives of the Most Eminent Painters, Sculptors, and Architects, Volume 5. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Avai in June 2016. Lives of the Most Eminent Painters, Sculptors, and Architects, Volume 5 by Giorgio Vasari. Translated by Gaston Ducy de Verre. Life of Marco Calavrese, Painter When the world possesses some great light in any science, every least part is illuminated by its rays, some with greater brightness and some with less, and the miracles that result are also greater or less according to differences of air and place. Constantly, in truth, do we see a particular country producing a particular kind of intellect fitted for a particular kind of work, for which others are not fitted, nor can they ever attain, whatever labours they may endure, to the goal of supreme excellence. And if we marvel when we see growing in some province a fruit that has not been wont to grow there, much more can we rejoice in a man of fine intellect when we find him in a country where men of the same bent are not usually born. Thus it was with the painter Marco Calavrese, who, leaving his own country, chose for his habitation the sweet and pleasant city of Naples. 
he had been minded indeed on setting out to make his way to rome and there to achieve the end that rewards the student of painting but the song of the siren was so sweet to him and all the more because he delighted to play on the lute and the soft waters of sebeto so melted his heart that he remained a prisoner in body of that land until he rendered up his spirit to heaven and his mortal flesh to earth marco executed innumerable works in oils and in fresco and he proved himself more able than any other man who was practising the same art in that country in his day of this we have proof in the work that he executed at aversa ten miles distant from naples and above all in a panel picture in oils on the high altar of the church of sant'agostino with a large ornamental frame and various pictures painted with scenes and figures in which he represented saint augustine disputing with the heretics with stories of christ and saints in various attitudes both above and at the sides in this work which shows a manner full of harmony and drawing toward the good manner of our modern works may also be seen great beauty and facility of colouring and it was one of the many labours that he executed in that city and for various places in the kingdom marco always lived a gay life enjoying every minute to the full for the reason that having no rivalry to contend with in painting from other craftsmen he was always adored by the neapolitan nobles and contrived to have himself rewarded for his works by ample payments and so having come to the age of fifty-six he ended his life after an ordinary illness he left a disciple in giovan filippo crescione a painter of naples who executed many pictures in company with his brother-in-law leonardo castellani as he still does but of these men since they are alive and in constant practice of their art there is no need to make mention the pictures of maestro marco were executed by him between fifteen o eight and fifteen forty two he had a companion in another calabrian whose name i do not know who worked for a long time in rome with giovanni da udine and executed many works by himself in that city particularly facades in charoscuro the same calabrian also painted in fresco the chapel of the conception in the church of the trinita with much skill and diligence at this same time lived nicola commonly called by every one maestro cola dalla matrice who executed many works in calabria at ascoli and at norcia which are very well known and which gained for him the name of a rare master the best indeed that there had ever been in these parts and since he also gave his attention to architecture all the buildings that were erected in his day at ascoli and throughout all that province had him as architect cola without caring to see rome or to change his country remained always at ascoli living happily for some time with his wife a woman of good and honourable family and endowed with extraordinary nobility of spirit as was proved when the strife of parties arose at ascoli in the time of pope paul the third for then while she was flying with her husband with many soldiers in pursuit more on her account for she was a very beautiful young woman than for any other reason she resolved not seeing any other way in which she could save her own honour and the life of her husband to throw herself from a high cliff to the depth below at which all the soldiers believed that she was not only mortally injured but dashed to pieces as indeed she was wherefore they left the husband without doing him any harm and returned to ascoli after the death of this extraordinary woman worthy of eternal praise maestro cola passed the rest of his life with little happiness a short time afterwards signor alessandro vitelli who had become lord of matrice took maestro cola now an old man to città de castello where he caused him to paint in his palace many works in fresco and many other pictures which works finished maestro cola returned to finish his life at matrice this master would have acquitted himself not otherwise than passing well if he had practised his art in places where rivalry and emulation might have made him attend with more study to painting and exercise the beautiful intellect with which it is evident that he was endowed by nature End of chapter twenty five
Chapter 26 of Lives of the Most Eminent Painters, Sculptors, and Architects, Volume 5. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Lives of the Most Eminent Painters, Sculptors, and Architects, Volume 5 by Giorgio Vasari. Translated by Gaston de Cidever. Life of Francesco Mazzuoli, Parmigiano, Painter of Parma, Part 1 Among the many natives of Lombardy who have been endowed with a gracious gift of design, with a lovely spirit of invention, and with a particular manner of making beautiful landscapes in their pictures, we should rate as second to none, and even place before all the rest, Francesco Mazzuoli of Parma who was bountifully endowed by heaven with all those parts that are necessary to make a supreme painter, insomuch that he gave to his figures, in addition to what has been said of many others, a certain nobility, sweetness, and grace in the attitudes which belong to him alone. To his heads, likewise, it is evident that he gave all the consideration that is needful, and his manner has therefore been studied and imitated by innumerable painters, because he shed on art a light of grace so pleasing that his works will always be held in great price and himself honoured by all students of design. Would to God that he had always pursued the studies of painting and had not sought to pry into the secrets of congealing mercury in order to become richer than nature and heaven had made him, for then he would have been without an equal and truly unique in the art of painting whereas by searching for that which he could never find he wasted his time, wronged his art, and did harm to his own life and fame. Francesco was born at Parma in the year 1504, and because he lost his father when he was still a child of tender age, he was left to the care of two uncles, brothers of his father, and both painters, who brought him up with the greatest lovingness, teaching him all those praiseworthy ways that befit a Christian man and a good citizen. Then, having made some little growth, he had no sooner taken pen in hand in order to learn to write, than he began, spurred by nature, who had consecrated him at his birth to design, to draw most marvellous things. And the master who was teaching him to write, noticing this and perceiving to what heights the genius of the boy might in time attain, persuaded his uncles to let him give his attention to design and painting. Whereupon, being men of good judgment in matters of art, although they were old and painters of no great fame, and recognizing that God and nature had been the boy's first masters, they did not fail to take the greatest pains to make him learn to draw under the discipline of the best masters, to the end that he might acquire a good manner. And coming by degrees to believe that he had been born, so to speak, with brushes in his fingers, on the one hand they urged him on, and on the other, fearing lest overmuch study might perchance spoil his health, they would sometimes hold him back. Finally, having come to the age of sixteen and having already done miracles of drawing, he painted a St. John baptizing Christ of his own invention on a panel, which he executed in such a manner that even now whoever sees it stands marvelling that such a work should have been painted so well by a boy. This picture was placed in the Nunziata, the seat of the Frati de Zoccoli at Parma. Not content with this, however, Francesco resolved to try his hand at working in fresco, and therefore painted a chapel in San Giovanni Evangelista, a house of black friars of St. Benedict, and since he succeeded in that kind of work, he painted as many as seven. But about that time Pope Leo X sent Signor Prospero Colonna with an army to Parma, and the uncles of Francesco, fearing that he might perchance lose time or be distracted, sent him in company with his cousin, Girolamo Mazzuoli, another boy painter, to Viadana, a place belonging to the Duke of Mantua, where they lived all the time that the war lasted, and there Francesco painted two panels in distemper. One of these, in which are St. Francis receiving the stigmata, and Santa Chiara, was placed in the church of the Frati de Zoccoli, and the other, which contains the marriage of St. Catherine with many figures, was placed in San Pietro. 
and let no one believe that these are the works of a young beginner, for they seem rather by the hand of a full-grown master. The war finished, Francesco, having returned with his cousin to Parma, first completed some pictures that he had left unfinished at his departure, which are in the hands of various people. After this he painted a panel picture in oils of Our Lady with a child in her arms, with St. Jerome on one side and the blessed Bernardino da Feltro on the other, and in the head of one of these figures he made a portrait of the patron of the picture, which is so wonderful that it lacks nothing save the breath of life. All these works he executed before he had reached the age of nineteen. Then, having conceived a desire to see Rome, like one who was on the path of progress and heard much praise given to the works of good masters, and particularly to those of Raffaello and Michelangelo, he spoke out his mind and desire to his old uncles, who, thinking that such a wish was not otherwise than worthy of praise, said that they were content that he should go, but that it would be well for him to take with him some work by his own hand, which might serve to introduce him to the noblemen of that city, and to the craftsmen of his profession. This advice was not displeasing to Francesco, and he painted three pictures, two small and one of some size, representing in the last the child in the arms of the Madonna, taking some fruits from the lap of an angel, and an old man with his arms covered with hair, executed with art and judgment and pleasing in colour. Besides this, in order to investigate the subtleties of art, he set himself one day to make his own portrait, looking at himself in a convex barber's mirror. In doing this, perceiving the bizarre effects produced by the roundness of the mirror, which twists the beams of the ceiling into strange curves, and makes the doors and other parts of buildings recede in an extraordinary manner, the idea came to him to amuse himself by counterfeiting everything. Thereupon he had a ball of wood made by a turner, and dividing it in half so as to make it the same in size and shape as a mirror, set to work to counterfeit on it with supreme art all that he saw in the glass, and particularly his own self, which he did with such lifelike reality as could not be imagined or believed. Now everything that is near the mirror is magnified, and all that is in the distance is diminished, and thus he made the hand engaged in drawing somewhat large, as the mirror showed it, and so marvellous that it seemed to be his very own. And since Francesco had an air of great beauty, with a face and aspect full of grace, in the likeness rather of an angel than of a man, his image on that ball had the appearance of a thing divine. So happily, indeed, did he succeed in the whole of this work, that the painting was no less real than the reality, and in it were seen the lustre of the glass, the reflection of every detail, and the lights and shadows, all so true and natural, that nothing more could have been looked for from the brain of man. Having finished these works, which were held by his old uncles to be out of the ordinary, and even considered by many other good judges of art to be miracles of beauty, and having packed up both pictures and portrait, he made his way to Rome, accompanied by one of the uncles. There, after the datary had seen the pictures and appraised them at their true worth, the young man and his uncle were straightway introduced to Pope Clement, who, seeing the works and the youthfulness of Francesco, was struck with astonishment, and with him all his court. And afterwards his holiness, having first shown him much favour, said that he wished to commission him to paint the hall of the popes, in which Giovanni da Udine had already decorated all the ceiling with stucco work and painting. And so, after presenting his pictures to the Pope and receiving various gifts and marks of favour in addition to his promises, Francesco, spurred by the praise and glory that he had heard bestowed upon him, and by the hope of the prophet that he might expect from so great a pontiff, painted a most beautiful picture of the circumcision, which was held to be extraordinary in invention on account of three most fanciful lights that shone in the work. For the first figures were illuminated by the radiance of the countenance of Christ. The second received their light from others who were walking up some steps with burning torches in their hands, bringing offerings for the sacrifice. And the last were revealed and illuminated by the light of the dawn, which played upon a most lovely landscape with a vast number of buildings. 
This picture finished, he presented it to the Pope, who did not do with it what he had done with the others, for he had given the picture of Our Lady to Cardinal Ippolito de' Medici, his nephew, and the mirror portrait to Messer Pietro Aretino, the poet, who was in his service. But the picture of the circumcision he kept for himself, and it is believed that it came in time into the possession of the emperor. The mirror portrait I remember to have seen, when quite a young man, in the house of the same Monsieur Pietro Aretino of Arezzo, where it was sought out as a choice work by the strangers passing through that city. Afterwards it fell, I know not how, into the hands of Valerio Vicentino, the crystal engraver, and it is now in the possession of Alessandro Vittoria, a sculptor in Venice, the disciple of Jacopo Sansovino. But to return to Francesco, while studying in Rome he set himself to examine all the ancient and modern works, both of sculpture and of painting, that were in that city, but held those of Michelangelo Bonarotti and Raffaello d'Arbino in supreme veneration beyond all the others, and it was said afterwards that the spirit of that Raffaello had passed into the body of Francesco when men saw how excellent the young man was in art and how gentle and gracious in his ways, as was Raffaello, and above all when it became known how much Francesco strove to imitate him in everything, and particularly in painting. Nor was this study in vain, for many little pictures that he painted in Rome, the greater part of which afterwards came into the hands of Cardinal Ippolito de' Medici, were truly marvellous, and even such is a round picture with a very beautiful annunciation, executed by him for Monsieur Agnolo Cesis, which is now treasured as a rare work in the house of that family. He painted a picture likewise of the Madonna with Christ, some angels, and a Saint Joseph, which are beautiful to a marvel on account of the expressions of the heads, the colouring, and the grace and diligence with which they are seen to have been executed. This work was formerly in the possession of Luigi Gaddi, but it must now be in the hands of his heirs. Hearing the fame of this master, Signor Lorenzo Cibo, captain of the papal guard, and a very handsome man, had a portrait of himself painted by Francesco, who may be said to have made not a portrait, but a living figure of flesh and blood. Having then been commissioned to paint for Madonna Maria Buffolini of Città di Castello, a panel picture which was to be placed in San Salvatore de Lauro, in a chapel near the door, Francesco painted in it a Madonna in the sky, who is reading and has the child between her knees, and on the earth he made a figure of St. John, kneeling on one knee in an attitude of extraordinary beauty, turning his body and pointing to the infant Christ, and lying asleep on the ground in foreshortening is a Saint Jerome in penitence. But he was prevented from bringing this work to completion by the ruin and sack of Rome in 1527, which was the reason not only that the arts were banished for a time, but also that many craftsmen lost their lives. And Francesco, also, came within a hair's breadth of losing his, seeing that at the beginning of the sack he was so intent on his work, that when the soldiers were entering the houses, and some Germans were already in his, he did not move from his painting for all the uproar that they were making. But when they came upon him and saw him working, they were so struck with astonishment at the work that, like the gentlemen that they must have been, they let him go. And thus, while the impious cruelty of those barbarous hordes was ruining the unhappy city and all its treasures, both sacred and profane, without showing respect to either God or man, Francesco was provided for and greatly honoured by those Germans and protected from all injury. All the hardship that he suffered at that time was this, that he was forced, one of them being a great lover of painting, to make a vast number of drawings in watercolour and with a pen, which formed the payment of his ransom. But afterwards, when these soldiers changed their quarters, Francesco nearly came to an evil end, because going to look for some friends, he was made prisoner by other soldiers, and compelled to pay as ransom some few crowns that he possessed. Wherefore his uncle, grieved by that and by the fact that this disaster had robbed Francesco of his hopes of acquiring knowledge, honour and profit, and seeing Rome almost wholly in ruins and the Pope the prisoner of the Spaniards, determined to take him back to Parma. 
and so he set Francesco on his way to his native city, but himself remained for some days in Rome, where he deposited the panel picture painted for Madonna Maria Buffolini with the friars of the Pace, in whose refectory it remained for many years, until finally it was taken by Monsieur Giulio Buffolini to the church of his family in Città di Castello. Having arrived in Bologna, and finding entertainment with many friends, and particularly in the house of his most intimate friend, a saddler of Parma, Francesco stayed some months in that city, where the life pleased him, during which time he had some works engraved and printed in chiaroscuro, among others the beheading of St. Peter and St. Paul, and a large figure of Diogenes. He also prepared many others, in order to have them engraved on copper and printed, having with him for this purpose one Maestro Antonio da Trento, but he did not carry this intention into effect at the time, because he was forced to set his hand to executing many pictures and other works for gentlemen of Bologna. The first picture by his hand that was seen at Bologna was a San Rocco, of great size, in the chapel of the Monsignori in San Petronio, to which saint he gave a marvellous aspect, making him very beautiful in every part, and conceiving him as somewhat relieved from the pain that the plague sore in the thigh gave him, which he shows by looking with uplifted head towards heaven in the act of thanking God, as good men do in spite of the adversities that fall upon them. This work he executed for one Fabrizio da Milano, of whom he painted a portrait from the waist upwards in the picture, with the hands clasped, which seems to be alive, and equally real also seems a dog that is there, with some landscapes which are very beautiful, Francesco being particularly excellent in this respect. He then painted for Albio, a physician of Parma, a conversion of St. Paul with many figures in the landscape, which was a very choice work. And for his friend the saddler he executed another picture of extraordinary beauty, containing a Madonna turned to one side in a lovely attitude, and several other figures. He also painted a picture for Count Giorgio Manzuoli, and two canvases in gouache, with some little figures, all graceful and well executed, for Maestro Luca Dai Lauti. End of chapter 26「Chapter 27 of Lives of the Most Eminent Painters, Sculptors and Architects, Volume 5. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Lives of the Most Eminent Painters, Sculptors and Architects, Volume 5 by Giorgio Vasari. Translated by Gaston de Cedever. Life of Francesco Mazzuoli. Parmigiano. Part 2. One morning about this time, while Francesco was still in bed, the aforesaid Antonio da Trento, who was living with him as his engraver, opened a strong box and robbed him of all the copper plate engravings, woodcuts, and drawings that he possessed, and he must have gone off to the devil for all the news that was ever heard of him. The engravings and woodcuts, indeed, Francesco recovered for Antonio had left them with a friend in Bologna, perchance with the intention of reclaiming them at his convenience, but the drawings he was never able to get back. Driven almost out of his mind by this, he returned to his painting, and made a portrait, for the sake of money, of I know not what count of Bologna. After that he painted a picture of Our Lady with a Christ who is holding a globe of the world, the Madonna has a most beautiful expression, and the child is also very natural, for he always gave to the faces of children a vivacious and truly childlike air, which yet reveals that subtle and mischievous spirit that children often have. And he attired the Madonna in a very unusual fashion, clothing her in a garment that had sleeves of yellowish gauze, striped, as it were, with gold, which gave a truly beautiful and graceful effect revealing the flesh in a natural and delicate manner, besides which the hair is painted so well that there is none better to be seen. This picture was painted for Monsieur Pietro Aretino, but Francesco gave it to Pope Clement, who came to Bologna at that time. Then, in some way of which I know nothing, it fell into the hands of Monsieur Dionigi Gianni, 
and it now belongs to his son, Monsieur Bartolomeo, who has been so accommodating with it that it has been copied fifty times, so much is it prized. The same master painted for the nuns of Santa Margherita in Bologna a panel picture containing a Madonna, St. Margaret, San Petronio, St. Jerome, and St. Michael, which is held in vast veneration, as it deserves, since in the expressions of the heads and in every other part it is as fine as all the other works of this painter. He made many drawings likewise, and in particular some for Girolamo del Lino, and some for Girolamo Fagiuoli, a goldsmith and engraver, who desired them for engraving on copper, and these drawings are held to be full of grace. For Bonifazio Gozzadino he painted his portrait from life, with one of his wife, which remained unfinished. He also began a picture of Our Lady, which was afterwards sold in Bologna to Giorgio Vasari of Arezzo, who has it in the new house built by himself at Arezzo, together with many other noble pictures, works of sculpture, and ancient marbles. When the Emperor Charles V was at Bologna to be crowned by Clement VII, Francesco, who went several times to see him at table, but without drawing his portrait, made a likeness of that emperor in a very large picture in oils, wherein he painted fame crowning him with laurel, and a boy in the form of a little Hercules offering him a globe of the world, giving him, as it were, the dominion over it. This work, when finished, he showed to Pope Clement, who was so pleased with it that he sent it and Francesco together, accompanied by the Bishop of Vassona, then Datary, to the emperor, at which his majesty, to whom it gave much satisfaction, hinted that it should be left with him. But Francesco, being ill-advised by an insincere or injudicious friend, refused to leave it, saying that it was not finished, and so his majesty did not have it, and Francesco was not rewarded for it, as he certainly would have been. This picture, having afterwards fallen into the hands of Cardinal Ippolito de' Medici, was presented by him to the Cardinal of Mantua, and it is now in the guardaroba of the Duke of that city, with many other most noble and beautiful pictures. After having been so many years out of his native place, as we have related, during which he had gained much experience in art, without accumulating any store of riches but only of friends, Francesco, in order to satisfy his many friends and relatives, finally returned to Parma. Arriving there, he was straightway commissioned to paint in fresco a vault of some size in the church of Santa Maria della Steccata, but since in front of that vault there was a flat arch which followed the curve of the vaulting, making a sort of façade, he set to work first on the arch, as being the easier, and painted therein six very beautiful figures, two in colour and four in chiaroscuro. Between one figure and another he made some most beautiful ornaments, surrounding certain rosettes in relief, which he took it into his head to execute by himself in copper, taking extraordinary pains over them. At this same time he painted for the Chevalier Bayardo, a gentleman of Parma and his intimate friend, a picture of a Cupid, who is fashioning a bow with his one hand, and at his feet are seated two little boys, one of whom catches the other by the arm and laughingly urges him to touch Cupid with his finger, but he will not touch him and shows by his tears that he is afraid of burning himself at the fire of love. This picture, which is charming in colour, ingenious in invention and executed in that graceful manner of Francesco's, which has been much studied and imitated, as it still is, by craftsmen and by all who delight in art, is now in the study of Signor Marc Antonio Cavalca heir to the Chevalier Bayardo, together with many drawings of every kind by the hand of the same master, all most beautiful and highly finished, which he has collected. Even such are the many drawings also by the hand of Francesco that are in our book, and particularly that of the beheading of St. Peter and St. Paul, of which, as has been related, he published copper-plate engravings and woodcuts while living in Bologna. For the church of Santa Maria de Servi, he painted a panel picture of Our Lady with a child asleep in her arms, and on one side some angels, one of whom has in his arms an urn of crystal, wherein there glitters a cross, 
at which the Madonna gazes in contemplation. This work remained unfinished, because he was not well content with it, and yet it is much extolled and a good example of his manner, so full of grace and beauty. Meanwhile Francesco began to abandon the work of the staccata, or at least to carry it on so slowly that it was evident that he was not in earnest. And this happened because he had begun to study the problems of alchemy, and had quite deserted his profession of painting, thinking that he would become rich quicker by congealing mercury. Wherefore, wearing out his brain, but not in imagining beautiful inventions and executing them with brushes and color mixtures, he wasted his whole time in handling charcoal, wood, glass vessels, and other such like trumperies, which made him spend more in one day than he earned by a week's worth at the chapel of the staccata. Having no other means of livelihood and being yet compelled to live, he was wasting himself away little by little with those furnaces, and what was worse, the men of the company of the staccata, perceiving that he had completely abandoned the work and having perchance paid him more than his due, as is often done, brought a suit against him. Thereupon, thinking it better to withdraw, he fled by night with some friends to Casal Maggiore, and there, having dispersed a little of the alchemy out of his head, he painted a panel picture for the church of San Stefano, of Our Lady in the sky, with a St. John the Baptist and a St. Stephen below. Afterwards he executed a picture, the last that he ever painted, of the Roman Lucretia, which was a thing divine and one of the best that ever were seen by his hand. But it has disappeared, however that may have happened, so that no one knows where it is. By his hand also is a picture of some nymphs, which is now in the house of Monsieur Niccolò Buffolini, at Città di Castello, and a child's cradle, which was painted for Signora Angiola de Rossi of Parma, wife of Signora Alessandro Vitelli, and is likewise at Città di Castello. In the end, having his mind still set on his alchemy, like every other man who has once grown crazed over it, and changing from a dainty and gentle person into an almost savage man with long and unkempt beard and locks, a creature quite different from his other self, Francesco went from bad to worse, became melancholy and eccentric, and was assailed by a grievous fever and a cruel flux, which in a few days caused him to pass to a better life. And in this way he found an end to the troubles of this world, which was never known to him save as a place full of annoyances and cares. He wished to be laid to rest in the church of the Servite friars called La Fontana, one mile distant from Casal Maggiore and he was buried naked as he had directed, with a cross of Cyprus upright on his breast. He finished the course of his life on the 24th of August in the year of 1540, to the great loss of art on account of the singular grace that his hands gave to the pictures that he painted. Francesco delighted to play on the lute, and had a hand and a genius so well suited to it that he was no less excellent in this than in painting. It is certain that if he had not worked by caprice and had laid aside the follies of the alchemists, he would have been without a doubt one of the rarest and most excellent painters of our age. I do not deny that working at moments of fever heat and when one feels inclined may be the best plan. But I do blame a man for working little or not at all, and for wasting all his time over cogitations, seeing that the wish to arrive by trickery at a goal to which one cannot attain, often brings it about that one loses what one knows in seeking after that which is not given to us to know. If Francesco, who had from nature a spirit of great vivacity, with a beautiful and graceful manner, had persisted in working every day, little by little he would have made such proficience in art that, even as he gave a beautiful, gracious, and most charming expression to his head, so he would have surpassed his own self and the others in the solidity and perfect excellence of his drawing. He left behind him his cousin Girolamo Mazzuoli, who, with great credit to himself, always imitated his manner, as is proved by the works by his hand that are in Parma. At Viadana, also, whither he fled with Francesco on account of the war, he painted, young as he was, a very beautiful annunciation on a little panel for San Francesco, a seat of the Frati di Zoccoli, 
and he painted another for Santa Maria ne Borghi. For the conventual friars of St. Francis at Parma, he executed the panel picture of their high altar, containing Joachim being driven from the temple with many figures. And for Santa Alessandro, a convent of nuns in that city, he painted a panel with the Madonna in heaven, the infant Christ presenting a palm to Santa Giustina, and some angels drawing back a piece of drapery with St. Alexander the Pope and St. Benedict. For the church of the Carmelite friars he painted the panel picture of their high altar, which is very beautiful, and for San Sepulcro another panel picture of some size. In San Giovanni Evangelista, a church of nuns in the same city, are two panel pictures by the hand of Girolamo, of no little beauty, but not equal to the doors of the organ or to the picture of the high altar, in which is a most beautiful transfiguration, executed with much diligence. The same master has painted a perspective view in fresco in the refectory of those nuns, with a picture in oils of the Last Supper of Christ with the Apostles, and fresco paintings in the chapel of the high altar in the Duomo. And for Madama Margarita of Austria, Duchess of Parma, he has made a portrait of the Prince Don Alessandro, her son, in full armor, with his sword over a globe of the world, and an armed figure of Parma kneeling before him. In a chapel of the Steccata at Parma he has painted in fresco the Apostles receiving the Holy Spirit, and on an arch similar to that which his cousin Francesco painted, he has executed six sibyls, two in color and four in chiaroscuro, while in a niche opposite to that arch he has painted the Nativity of Christ, with the shepherds adoring him, which is a very beautiful picture, although it was left not quite finished. For the high altar of the Certosa, without Parma, he has painted a panel picture with the three magi, a panel of San Pietro, an abbey of monks at St. Bernard at Pavia, another for the Duomo of Mantua, at the commission of the cardinal, and yet another panel for San Giovanni in the same city, containing a Christ in a glory of light, surrounded by the apostles, with St. John, of whom he appears to be saying, Sic eum volo manere, etc., while round this panel, in six large pictures, are the miracles of the same St. John the Evangelist. In the church of the Frati Zuccolanti, on the left hand, there is a large panel picture of the conversion of St. Paul, a very beautiful work, by the hand of the same man. And for the high altar of San Benedetto in Polirone, a place twelve miles distant from Mantua, he has executed a panel picture of Christ in the manger being adored by the shepherds, with angels singing. He has also painted, but I do not know exactly at what time, a most beautiful picture of five loves, one of whom is sleeping, and the others are despoiling him, one taking away his bow, another his arrows, and the others his torch, which picture belongs to the Lord Duke Ottavio, who holds it in great account by reason of the excellence of Girolamo. This master has in no way fallen short of the standard of his cousin Francesco, being a fine painter, gentle and courteous beyond belief, and since he is still alive, there are seen issuing from his brush other works of rare beauty, which he has constantly in hand. A close friend of the aforesaid Francesco Mazzuoli was Monsieur Vincenzio Caccianimici, a gentleman of Bologna, who painted and strove to the best of his power to imitate the manners of Francesco. This Vincenzio was a very good colorist, so that the works which he executed for his own pleasure or to present to his friends and various noblemen are truly well worthy of praise, and such, in particular, is a panel picture in oils containing the beheading of St. John the Baptist, which is in the chapel of his family in St. Petronio. This talented gentleman, by whose hand are some very beautiful drawings in our book, died in the year 1542. End of chapter 27。chapter 28 of Lives of the Most Eminent Painters, Sculptors and Architects, Volume 5. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Lives of the Most Eminent Painters, Sculptors and Architects, Volume 5 by Giorgio Vasari. 
Translated by Gaston de C. de Ver. Lives of Giacomo Palma, Palma Vecchio, and Lorenzo Lotto, Painters of Venice. So potent are mastery and excellence, even when seen in only one or two works executed to perfection by a man in the art that he practices, that, no matter how small these may be, craftsmen and judges of art are forced to extol them, and writers are compelled to celebrate them and to give praise to the craftsman who has made them, even as we are now about to do for the Venetian Palma. This master, although not very eminent, nor remarkable for perfection of painting, was nevertheless so careful and diligent, and subjected himself so zealously to the labours of art, that a certain proportion of his works, if not all, have something good in them, in that they are close imitations of life, and of the natural appearance of men. Palma was much more remarkable in his patience in harmonising and blending colours than for baldness of design, and he handled colour with extraordinary grace and finish. This may be seen in Venice from many pictures and portraits that he executed for various gentlemen, but of these I shall say nothing more, since I propose to content myself with making mention of some altarpieces, and of a head that I hold to be marvellous, or rather divine. One of the altarpieces he painted for San Antonio, near Castello at Venice, and another for Santa Elena, near the Lido, where the monks of Monte Oliveto have their monastery. In the latter, which is on the high altar of that church, he painted the Magi presenting their offerings to Christ, with a good number of figures, among which are some heads truly worthy of praise, as also are the draperies executed with a beautiful flow of folds, which cover the figures. Palma also painted a life-size Saint Barbara for the altar of the Bombardieri in the church of San Maria Formosa, with two smaller figures at the side, Saint Sebastian and Saint Anthony, and the Saint Barbara is one of the best figures that this painter ever executed. The same master also executed another altarpiece in which is the Madonna in the sky with Saint John below, for the church of San Moise, near the Piazza di San Marco. In addition to this, Palma painted a most beautiful scene for the hall wherein the men of the Scuola of San Marco assemble, on the Piazza di San Giovanni e San Paolo, in emulation of those already executed by Giovanni Bellini, Giovanni Mansueti, and other painters. In this scene is depicted a ship which is bringing the body of St. Mark to Venice, and there may be seen counterfeited by Palma a terrible tempest on the sea and some barks tossed and shaken by the fury of the winds, all executed of much judgment and thoughtful care. The same may be said of a group of figures in the air, and of the demons in various forms who are blowing, after the manner of winds against the barks, which, driven by oars and striving in various ways to break through the dangers of the towering waves, are like to sink. In short, to tell the truth, this work is of such a kind and so beautiful in invention and in other respects, that it seems almost impossible that brushes and colours employed by human hands, however excellent, should be able to depict anything more true to reality or more natural, for in it may be seen the fury of the winds, the strength and dexterity of the men, the movement of the waves, the lightning flashes of the heavens, the water broken by the oars, and the oars bent by the waves and by the efforts of the rowers. Why say more? I, for my part, do not remember to have ever seen a more terrible painting than this, which is executed in such a manner, and with such care in the invention, the drawing, and the colouring, that the picture seems to quiver, as if all that is painted therein were real. For this work Jacopo Palma deserves the greatest praise, and the honour of being numbered among those who are masters of art, and who are able to express with facility in their pictures their most sublime conceptions. For many painters, in difficult subjects of that kind, achieve in the first sketch of their work as though guided by a sort of fire of inspiration, something of the good and certain measures of boldness. But afterwards, in finishing it, the boldness vanishes, and nothing is left of the good that the first fire produced." 
and this happens because very often in finishing they consider the parts and not the whole of what they are executing, and thus growing cold in spirit they come to lose their vein of boldness, whereas Jacopo stood ever firm in the same intention, and brought to perfection his first conception, for which he received vast praise at that time, as he always will. But without a doubt, although the works of this master were many, and all much esteemed, that one is better than all the others, and truly extraordinary, in which he made his own portrait from life by looking at himself in a mirror, with some camel skins about him, and certain tufts of hair, and all so lifelike that nothing better could be imagined. For so much did the genius of Palma effect in this particular work, that he made it quite miraculous and beautiful beyond belief, as all men declare, the picture being seen almost every year at the festival of the Ascension and in truth it well deserves to be celebrated, in point of draughtsmanship, colouring, and mastery of art, in a word on account of its absolute perfection, beyond any other work whatsoever that had been executed by any Venetian painter up to that time, since beside other things there may be seen in the eyes a roundness so perfect that Leonardo da Vinci and Michelagnolo Buonarroti would not have done it in any other way but it is better to say nothing of the grace, the dignity, and the other qualities that are to be seen in this portrait, because it is not possible to say as much of its perfection as would exhaust its merits. If fate had decreed that Palma should die after this work, he would have carried off with him the glory of having surpassed all those whom we celebrate as our rarest and most divine intellects. But the duration of his life, keeping him at work, brought it about that, not maintaining the high beginning that he had made, he came to deteriorate as much as most men had thought him destined to improve. Finally, content that one or two supreme works should have cleared him of some of the censure that the others had brought upon him, he died in Venice at the age of forty-eight. A friend and companion of Palma was Lorenzo Lotto, the painter of Venice, who, after imitating for some time the manner of the Bellini, attached himself to that of Giorgione, as is shown by many pictures and portraits which are in the houses of gentlemen in Venice. In the house of Andrea Odoni there is a portrait of him, which is very beautiful by the hand of Lorenzo. And in the house of Tommaso da Empoli, a Florentine, there is a picture of the Nativity of Christ, painted as an effect of night, which is one of great beauty, particularly because the splendour of Christ is seen to illuminate the picture in a marvellous manner, and there is a Madonna kneeling, with a portrait of Messer Marco Loredano, in a full-length figure that is adoring Christ. For the Carmelite friars the same master painted an altarpiece showing St. Nicholas and his episcopal robes, poised in the air, with three angels. Below him are Santa Lucia and St. John, on high some clouds, and beneath these a most beautiful landscape, with many little figures and animals in various places. On one side is a St. George on horseback slaying the dragon, and at a little distance a maiden, with a city not far away, and an arm of the sea. For the chapel of San Antonio, Archbishop of Florence, in San Giovanni e San Paolo, Lorenzo executed an altarpiece containing the first-named saint seated with two priests in attendance, and many people below. While this painter was still young, imitating partly the manner of the Bellini and partly that of Giorgione, he painted an altarpiece divided into six pictures for the high altar of St. Dominic at Recanati. In the central picture is the Madonna with a child in her arms, giving the habit, by the hands of an angel, to St. Dominic, who is kneeling before the Virgin. And in this picture are also two little boys, one playing on a lute and the other on a rebeck. In the second picture are the popes St. Gregory and St. Urban, and in the third a St. Thomas Aquinas, with another saint who was bishop at Recanati. Above these are the three other pictures, and in the centre, above the Madonna, is a dead Christ supported by an angel, with his mother kissing his arm, and a St. Magdalene. Over the picture of St. Gregory are St. Mary Magdalene and St. Vincent, and in the third, namely above the St. Thomas Aquinas, are St. Gismondo and St. Catherine of Siena. 
In the predella, which is a rare work painted with little figures, there is in the centre the scene of Santa Maria di Loreto being carried by the angels from the regions of Sclavonia to the place where it now stands. Of the two scenes that are on either side of this, one shows St. Dominic preaching, the little figures being the most graceful in the world, and the other Pope Honorius confirming the rule of St. Dominic. In the middle of this church is a figure of St. Vincent, the friar, executed in fresco by the hand of the same master, and in the church of Santa Maria de Castelnuovo there is an altarpiece in oils of the Transfiguration of Christ, with three scenes painted with little figures in the predella, Christ leading the apostles to Mount Tabor, his prayer in the garden, and his ascension into heaven. After these works Lorenzo went to Ancona, at the very time when Mariano da Perugia had finished a panel picture with a large ornamental frame for the high altar of San Agostino. This did not give much satisfaction, and Lorenzo was commissioned to paint a picture which is placed in the middle of the same church of Our Lady with the Child in her lap, and two figures of angels in the air, in foreshortening, crowning the Virgin. Finally, being now old and having almost lost his voice, Lorenzo made his way, after executing some other works of no great importance at Ancona, to the Madonna of Loreto, where he had already painted an altarpiece in oils, which is in the chapel at the right hand of the entrance into the church. There, having resolved to finish his life in the service of the Madonna, and to make that holy house his habitation, he set his hand to executing scenes with figures one braccio or less in height around the choir, over the seats of the priests. In one scene he painted the birth of Jesus Christ, in the other the Magi adoring him. Next came the presentation to Simeon, and after that a baptism of Christ by John in the Jordan. There was also a woman taken in adultery, being led before Christ, and all these were executed with much grace. Two other scenes, likewise, did he paint there, with an abundance of figures, one of David causing a sacrifice to be offered, and in the other was the archangel Michael in combat with Lucifer, after having driven him out of heaven. These works finished, no long time had passed when, even as he lived like a good citizen and a true Christian, so he died, rendering up his soul to God his master. These last years of his life he found full of happiness and serenity of mind, and what is more, we cannot but believe that they gave him the earnest of the blessings of eternal life, which might not have happened to him if at the end of his life he had been wrapped up too closely in the things of this world, which, pressing too heavily on those who put their whole trust in them, prevent them from ever raising their minds to the true riches and the supreme blessedness and felicity of the other life. There also flourished in Romagna at this time the excellent painter Rondinello, of whom we made some slight mention in the life of Giovanni Bellini, whose disciple he was, assisting him much in his works. This Rondinello, after leaving Giovanni Bellini, laboured at his art to such purpose that, being very diligent, he executed many works worthy of praise, of which we have witnessed in the panel picture of the high altar in the Duomo at Forlì, showing Christ giving the communion to the apostles, which he painted there with his own hand, executing it very well. In the lunette above this picture he painted a dead Christ, and in the predella some scenes with little figures, finished with great diligence, representing the actions of St. Helena, the mother of the Emperor Constantine, in the finding of the cross. He also painted a single figure of St. Sebastian, which is very beautiful, in a picture in the same church. For the altar of Santa Maria Magdalena, in the Duomo of Ravenna, he painted a panel picture in oils containing the single figure of that saint, and below this, in a predella, he executed three scenes with very graceful little figures. In one is Christ appearing to Mary Magdalene in the form of a gardener, in another St. Peter leaving the ship and walking over the water towards Christ and in between them the baptism of Jesus Christ, and all are very beautiful. For San Giovanni Evangelista, in the same city, he painted two panel pictures, one with a saint consecrating the church, and in the other three martyrs, San Cantius, San Cantianus, and San Cantianilla, figures of great beauty. 
in San Napolinare, also in that city, are two pictures highly extolled, each with a single figure, St. John the Baptist and St. Sebastian. And in the church of the Spiritu Santo there is a panel, likewise by his hand, containing the Madonna placed between the Virgin Martyr St. Catherine and St. Jerome. For San Francesco, likewise, he painted two panel pictures, one of St. Catherine and St. Francis, and in the other Our Lady with St. James the Apostle, St. Francis, and many other figures. For San Domenico, in like manner, he executed two other panels, one in which containing the Madonna and many figures is on the left hand of the high altar, and the other, a work of no little beauty, is on a wall of the church. And for the church of San Nicolò, a convent of friars of St. Augustine, he painted another panel, with St. Lawrence and St. Francis. So much was he commended for all these works, that during his lifetime he was held in great account, not only in Ravenna, but throughout all Romagna. Rondinello lived to the age of sixty, and was buried in San Francesco at Ravenna. This master left behind him Francesco da Cotignola, a painter likewise held in estimation in that city, who painted many works, in particular for the high altar of the church of the Abbey of Classi in Ravenna, a panel picture of some size representing the racing Lazarus, with many figures. There, opposite to that work, in the year 1548, Giorgio Vasari executed for Don Remulado da Verona, abbot of that place, another panel picture containing the deposition of Christ from the cross, with a large number of figures. Francesco also painted a panel picture of the Nativity of Christ, which is of great size, for San Nicolò, and likewise two panels with various figures for San Sebastiano. For the hospital of Santa Catarina, he painted a panel picture with Our Lady, St. Catherine, and many other figures, and for Santa Agata, he painted a panel with Christ crucified, the Madonna at the foot of the cross, and a good number of other figures, for which he won praise. And for San Apollinare, in the same city, he executed three panel pictures, one for the high altar containing the Madonna, St. John the Baptist, and San Apollinare, with St. Jerome and other saints, another likewise of the Madonna, with St. Peter and St. Catherine, and in the third and last, Jesus Christ bearing his cross, but this he was not able to finish, being overtaken by death. Francesco was a very pleasing colorist, but not so good a draughtsman as Rondinello, yet he was held in no small estimation by the people of Ravenna. He chose to be buried after his death in San Napolinare, for which he had painted the said figures, being content that his remains, when he was dead, should lie at rest in the place for which he had laboured when alive. End of chapter 28 End of Lives of the Most Eminent Painters, Sculptors and Architects, Volume 5, by Giorgio Vasari Translated by Gaston de Cidevere